the privatization of prisons and detention centers has been a source of debate for over three decades. There has to be some things in our society that we agree are not a business opportunity. There's absolutely nothing wrong with profiting off of anything. The question is, are you providing a service with good quality, with humane conditions, and so on? The moral imperative of government should be to deliver the best outcomes. The U.S. privatized parts of its state and federal corrections and detention facilities in the 1980s. Two companies in particular, CoreCivic and Geo Group, have dominated the industry. But the uncertainty of a highly polarized industry stems mainly from the political climate. At the end of President Obama's second term, then-Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates announced that the administration would phase out private prisons. Core Civic and Geo stocks plummeted. Two months later, President Trump was elected and the stocks soared. There has been political sensitivity uh, in our stock. It's unfortunate, but our focus continues to be operations. That's what we can control. We can't control the political dynamic. But lately, things have taken a deeper turn. Democratic candidates call for a total abolition. A number of states have or could be banning the industry and Wall Street is divesting. On top of it all, prison populations are decreasing. That's a huge indictment. Despite all the noise in the market, companies have very good liquidity. How a company is structured on its balance sheet does not save it from a cultural revolution. Well, I don't know if it's a, a breaking point or a time of change, but I think it presents, it, again, an opportunity for us to be uh, uh, more transparent about what we do. Could this be the beginning of the end for private prisons? At the height of the war on drugs and tough on crime era, the country began imprisoning more people than ever. 750,000 people were incarcerated in America. By 1997, 1 1.7 million. With the growing prison population, so were the costs of operating prisons. From 1980 to 1994, Operating costs of state and federal prisons went from $3 million to nearly $18 million. Overcrowding was becoming increasingly problematic, and the government couldn't keep up. Private prisons were established to help maintain the $10 billion industry. Private prison companies could build facilities faster without voter approval. They also claimed they could provide a higher quality at a lower price. But the accuracy of that claim has been under scrutiny. No compelling government study is conclusive one way or another. In 1996, the General Accounting Office stated that they were not able to conclude that privatization saved money. A Department of Justice study from 2001 claimed that the average savings from privatization was only about 1% and not the projected 20%. There are a lot of accounting details that make it difficult to properly compare the cost between public and private. Um, and actually, there are a lot of factors that make it difficult to compare quality. The private prison model was simple. Build and manage buildings and secure government contracts. Charge a daily fee for each bed you fill, something called per diem, or what is commonly referred to as Mandy's. In 1987, Corrections Corporation of America, CCA, Today called Core Civic, charged $32.17 per inmate. By 1997, it charged the government 33% more. However, the company's cost only increased by about 8%. The company's revenue grew 27 times. Brian Evans is the CFO of Geo Group. So where do I look? At the camera or? About two-thirds of Geo Group's revenue comes from federal and state corrections and detention contracts. ICE contracts make up a fifth. Our business changed over the years. In 2003, the chairman and CEO, the founder of the company, George Zoli, uh, had a directive at that time to expand the company into other service lines, diversify, if you will, and to own and operate more of the facilities. So that process started in about 2003. We were about 500 million in revenue. Today, we're about two and a half billion in revenue. Uh, some of the, that growth has been through acquisitions, about half of it through acquisitions, and about half of it through organic growth, new contracts, uh, new facilities, uh, et cetera. In 
In November 2019, CNBC visited a jail group prison in Florida. Access to prisons for journalists is unusual. But Geo was able to grant us access with state approval within a week. We advocated on your behalf to, to be here because we want you to be here. And we like for people to come here and see what goes on, hopefully to change their minds. South Bay Correctional Facility is owned by the state of Florida, but has been managed by Geo since 2009, a contract worth $356 million for 11 years. It houses nearly 2,000 inmates that are incarcerated for a variety of crimes, ranging from low-level charges to felonies. GEO is paid $51.11 per inmate, or mandate. What do they do? What do they use? South Bay offers a number of educational, vocational, and substance abuse programs, many of which are mandated by the state. Socially work, school, friends, and you rate yourself for the eight. In 2015, GEO launched its Continuum of Care program. It's an expansion of in-prison programs and includes post-release support. According to the contract, the state pays GEO around $3 million for COC at South Bay. It was all about, okay, what's our role and responsibility? And that was to provide the most opportunities in making sure that uh, we did everything we could to provide the rehabilitative services so after they left, they wouldn't come back. Sean Killian was convicted of murder when he was 21 years old. He's 35 now. He's been at South Bay since 2011. When you're in state-run facilities, if you have longer than a five-year sentence, basically it's very difficult to get in programs. You know, they give priority to the guys that are about to get out, but at the same time, there's not a lot of programs offered. Here they have so many programs, and everybody's encouraged to take part in them. Between ICE, U.S. Marshals, Bureau of Prisons, and state, GEO manages about 70 facilities. We ask David Venturella how many of them look like this. Uh, how many of them look like this? Well, I would say all of the facilities uh, that we own either look like this or better. The ones that we manage, I would say, are pretty similar. But the visit to South Bay is one side of the private prison story. Less than a month prior to the tour, an inmate was flown to a hospital after a stabbing. Geo Group, like CoreCivic and other private prison companies, have been plagued with litigation and claims of human rights abuses. There's only two ways for a for-profit entity to create revenue. One is to increase your revenue basically by increasing your market share, and secondly, to cut costs. So to lower your expenses and therefore take home more profitability. And so if you're cutting costs when it comes to caring for humans, that's generally not going to put you in a good place. Do bad things happen in a, in a well-run system? Yes, they do. We don't try to cover it up. Um, and we try to learn from that. The George Hill Correctional Facility in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, for example, was operated by GEO from 2002 to 2008. Twelve inmates died at the facility during that time. They resumed control of the prison in 2017 when they acquired community education centers for $360 million. This is a jail that has significant, significant issues. We have had instances of wrongful death, suicides that have resulted in very large settlements with families. We've had issues with under maintenance um, that's resulted in, I wouldn't call it dangerous, but certainly inhumane conditions, continuous understaffing issues. Private prison companies occupy about 7% of the total state and federal correctional facilities market. That still produces billions of dollars in revenue. For detention, however, about 75% of total detainees are in private facilities. The funding of detention took off during President Obama's second term, coinciding with the increase in migrants from Central America. The Senate bill, as currently written and is hidden the floor, would put in place the toughest border enforcement plan that America has ever seen. Still, in August 2016, 
Then Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates announced her plan to phase out private prisons under the Bureau of Prisons. She said that private prison companies compared poorly to public prisons, largely based on data from a damning OIG report that was published the same month. I think the Inspector General cherry-picked some areas where we didn't match up as good with the BOP in those specific areas, but overall we had less grievances, we had uh, better uh, rates for uh, inmate violence and assaults and things like that. Overall grievances were higher in BOP prisons. However, the DOJ selected eight categories of grievances deemed particularly relevant to safety and security. In that analysis, inmates in private prisons filed 24% more grievances. The stocks plummeted. The Yates announcement would only affect the revenue streams coming from the federal correctional system. Moody saw enough risk and lowered their ratings. We knew that they, from a uh, liability and liquidity perspective, they were fine, but from a business perspective, we didn't know sort of what was, what was gonna happen after this. There was a lot of, of noise, and this was headline risk that we had always uh, incorporated in our ratings, but this came to fruition. It didn't come to fruition. Two months later, Donald Trump was elected president, and within days of coming into office, Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded the Yates memo. Stock prices soared. Private prison companies were those that won the most um, the following day after the election. The first year of the Trump administration where things were going, uh, you know, gangbusters for the industry. Alan Zibel has studied the federal detention and corrections funding. Trump has obviously been harsher in his treatment of, of immigrants, but it's really a continuation of, of a trend. Um, you know, family detention uh, started under Obama. If you look at our record on, over the last 20 years, both under Republican and Democratic administrations, talking at the federal level, you know, there's been steady growth of, you know, five to seven percent. And that's because of the services that we provide and the quality of the services. Campaign donations depict the industry favoring Republicans over Democrats. Core Civic and Geo Group each donated $250,000 to Trump's inaugural committee. Geo Group's contract revenue from ICE and U.S. Marshals is up by 43% from the last two years of President Obama to the first two years of the Trump administration. Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the Zero Tolerance Policy in April 2018. It was meant to ramp up the criminal prosecution of people entering the United States illegally. But images of separated families at the border and the detention of migrants under questionable conditions... Donald Trump! Shame! Donald Trump! Shame! ...unleashed a firestorm. The immigration policy under this particular administration really disturbed people. The administration lit a fire. So we're keeping families together and this will solve... On June 20th, 2018, President Trump signed an executive order to halt the separation of families. And it continues to be a zero tolerance. By then, 3,000 children had already been separated from their parents. But it continued. And to this day, the exact number is unclear. We had no role in operating the border facilities, which is where you saw a lot of pictures of overcrowded, inhumane conditions. Those aren't our facilities. They don't look anything like that. We also don't house unaccompanied minors. Sparked by an outraged public, the Families Belong Together Coalition was formed. 250 organizations came together to protest, collect signatures, and raise awareness and money to help families reunite. But a few wanted more. Jen Armstrong co-authored a report that looked at who was profiting off of the detention of migrants, and private prisons were a part of it. Something that is really key to understanding about private prisons is that they're actually structured as something called real estate investment trust, or REITs, R-E-I-T-S. The interesting thing about this structure is that it actually allows these two companies to largely avoid paying income taxes. The flip side of that, however, is that they are actually required to pass on about 90% of their taxable income to investors in the form of dividends. Um, and so they don't actually get to keep much cash on hand, which requires them to really wholly rely on a bunch of short-term borrowing 
um, to for their operations, for any expansions that they want to do. That's where Wall Street came in. By mid-2016, GEO had $1.9 billion in debt, and Core Civic, then CCA, had $1.5 billion, and six banks largely financed it. We know that private prisons make money when we're detaining more people during this immigration crisis, but what people don't see are this large syndicate of banks that are providing all the financing for all the operations for these uh, companies who are then also profiting through interest and fees and uh, various income that they get from their financing relationship. Activists took matters into their own hands. The coalition mass organized to urge the banks to divest. By March 2019, the group got their first win when J.P. Morgan announced they would no longer bank with the industry. Seven banks have followed suit. It's actually 87.4% of all of the known uh, financing for lines of credit and term loans for these two companies. In June 2019, Elizabeth Warren published a statement that if elected, she will shut down the use of federal private detention facilities. Many other candidates have espoused similar intentions. Nevada and California signed into law bans that would eventually phase out private prisons. Colorado and Minnesota could soon. The largest pension fund in the country, the California Public Employees Retirement System, is divesting. So have a number of city pensions. In response, the stocks of GEO and Core Civic have fallen by 30 percent since June 2019. That's exactly what happens when um, you mass organize. And so when you have every Democratic presidential candidate saying, if I win, private prisons are abolished, that's not just about the candidates themselves. It's now a party stance. And in a two-party system, that business should be very concerned. We redid our, our credit facility, our, which is about $1.8 billion credit facility. We renewed that in June of this year. And most of the other banks participated in that process and uh, renewed with us through 2024. So some of them since then have made public statements that they don't intend to renew in the future, but I think we'll just have to see how that plays out. We continue to dialogue with many of those banks. Uh, we dialogue with other institutions, but we'll be able to access capital. Fitch downgraded Core Civic and changed its outlook to negative. They do not rate Geo Group. Moody's has not changed their rating since 2016. There's a lot of headline risk, obviously, and despite all the noise in the market, companies have very good liquidity. For example, Core Civic has one bond coming due next year, but they have enough. They have over 600 million in liquidity right now. Geo, they don't have anything due to 2023 either. Both of them are, you know, their, their renewal, their retention rates, so far both of them are in the high 90s. They both reported earnings growth and uh, what they call NOI growth, which is net operating income per the different contracts. They both have added, uh, it, it's funny to say it this way, but they all, all have added uh, people to their beds, or they call it heads in the beds. So from our perspective, we're very comfortable where our ratings are right now. Hadan Seagram is an assistant professor of finance at NYU and has studied Geo Group and Core Civic's balance sheets over a five-year period. The business is largely dependent on who's funding and who's in power rather than the fundamentals itself. Therefore, as long as this administration is willing to fund them, uh, they're going to be doing reasonably well. Only issue with these companies, they don't have enough debt financing for growth. So if they don't have that, and if the major banks pull out of it, like Bank of America, JPM, and Wells Fargo, they can be in a steady state, but they cannot grow as much as they want to. Those concerns may be slowly vanishing. After failing to raise a $250 million term loan back in June, DebtWire reported on December 13, 2019, that Core Civic was working with a Japanese investment bank to raise the money. 
something activists have long feared could be happening. Divestment is as much about the financial conversation and the financial impact as it is about shifting culture, shifting the narrative, and getting policy to reflect the values of the people. So regardless of how strong Core Civics and Geo Group's financials are, the culture can still eliminate them. A lot can happen between now and when the financing terms mature for Core Civic and Geo Group. While significantly more expensive, more foreign banks like Nomura can step in and fill the gap. An election can swing things dramatically and the companies can continue to diversify their portfolios to protect themselves. Set the children free! Set the children All the while, the American public is more engaged than ever. And you can say, is it the beginning of the end and does the end look like 2020? Maybe not. But whether the end is 2020 or the end is 2024, it's inevitable. It's coming. The toss of a coin, pretty much.